Okay, so we have a complete system now for how to solve a system of linear equations. Uh, we have a, a, a process that we're allowed to follow. It involves taking elementary row operations. These preserve the solutions to a system of equations. Um, we have a target. That's reduced row echelon form. That's what we aim for while we're applying our elementary row operations. That's what we're trying to get to because then we can deduce directly from that form what this complete set of solutions is, uh, if any. And we have a strategy for how to get there. That's Gauss-Jordan elimination. Gauss-Jordan elimination is a process that methodically will get you into reduced row echelon form. Okay, so now we're going to ask some questions about those solutions. We're going to ask something called the existence question, uh, something called the uniqueness question. And it turns out, interestingly, that those questions are going to relate closely to something called the rank of a matrix. And uh, it's a, a deceptively simple definition. Uh, the rank of a matrix is very simply just the number of pivots in its reduced row echelon form. You take a matrix. Put it in reduced rational on form, count the pivots. That's all rank is. And something that simple, it's surprising that it's so closely related to these uh, existence and uniqueness questions. So let's talk about those uh, one at a time. We're going to start with existence. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, a simpler question, which is suppose that I have a system of equations. Now you'll notice that I already have this into reduced rational on form. There's a pivot there. There's a pivot there, uh, and the pivot columns are all zeros, and uh, uh, increasing number of leading zeros, so all the rules are satisfied. Okay, and just at a glance here, let's ask, you know, how would we decide if solutions actually exist? Uh, are there any solutions? Well, the temptation is to say. Solve for your pivot variables in terms of your free variables. There's your solutions. But we do have to remember that there's an asterisk on that. And the asterisk is that that's only true if there's no contradictions. If there are contradictions, such as, for example, this might be a contradiction, depending on what this number here is. There might be a contradiction, in which case there are no solutions. And you can solve for your pivot variables all you want that doesn't change the fact that there are, there's a contradiction and therefore no solutions. Okay, so what it comes down to then is are there or are there not any contradictions? That's it. Really easy question. If you want to look at a system, a row reduced system, and decide if there are solutions, look for contradictions. Okay, right. That is not the existence question. What we have just discussed is a question about a system of equations. The existence question has to do with the coefficient matrix only. Right? So we say that a coefficient matrix has this property called the existence property. Uh, goes by the name sometimes general existence, universal existence. But this existence property uh, says that the solutions must exist no matter what is on the right hand side. Now let's contemplate that for the moment. Uh, in this uh, original scenario up here. Um, how could we possibly assert knowing only the coefficient matrix? Right, knowing only the coefficient matrix, how could we possibly assert that um, that solutions would necessarily exist? And the temptation now is to say, well, we can't answer this question because I don't know if there's uh, a zero or a not zero there. And I don't know if there's a zero or a not zero there. Right. So how could I, what circumstances could I ever actually assert that the answer to this question is yes? And the answer is, um, if there simply aren't any rows of zeros down here at all in the first place, if this is just all not here, right? And if we consider this, right? Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, consider this. That coefficient matrix, I can assert that. Uh, no matter what's on the right-hand side, not knowing in any way what's on the right-hand side, only looking at that coefficient matrix, I can guarantee that there's going to be solutions 
no matter what that number is, no matter what that number is, because there are no contradictions, because there's no potential for contradictions. There are no rows of zeros on the left that could possibly uh, contradict a non-zero on the right. Okay, so the answer to this existence question, you know, when does a matrix, does a, and again, I emphasize a coefficient matrix, when does a coefficient matrix have the existence property? When can I assert that solutions must exist no matter what's on the right hand side? The answer is no rows of zeros. No rows of zeros in the reduced row echelon form, that is. So there's, um, there's our condition. Um, a coefficient matrix has the existence property. There's no rows of zeros in the reduced row echelon form. Now, it's not hard to persuade yourself that some equivalent conditions, uh, that's equivalent to saying that there's a pivot in every row. Well, sure, because if there's a row of zeros, that would mean that there's not a pivot in that row. So if there's a pivot in every row, that means that there is no row of zeros. Right? Equivalently, the rank is equal to the number of rows. The number of pivots equals the number of rows. Because if those two numbers are equal, that means there's a pivot in every row. So these three conditions all say morally the same thing, even though they say, that, say them in different ways. Now, as promised, we see here that this interesting property, this interesting um, question, the existence question for a coefficient matrix relates in a very simple way to the number of pivots. How many pivots are there? That's it. Neat fact. Okay. All right, so a couple of examples. You look at this coefficient matrix here, and I don't even need to know what the numbers are on the right-hand side. It doesn't matter what these numbers end up being. This system of equations is going to have solutions, guaranteed, because there's no row of zeros. Right? Said differently, because there's a pivot in every row, no row of zeros, no potential for contradictions, you can definitely solve for your pivot variables in terms of your free variables, no problem. Okay. So this... Uh, the original matrix A here does have uh, the universal existence, does have the existence property. Okay, this matrix though does not. Um, got a pivot at first row, but there's no pivots in the second and third row. So if I were to contemplate the possibility of a system of equations here, and ask, can I guarantee there will be solutions? Oh, no, I, I cannot make any such guarantee. There's a, th th we might have a contradiction here, I mean, depending on what those numbers are, there and there. Okay, so this matrix does not uh, have the existence property. Okay. Said differently, notice one pivot, three rows, the number of pivots, the rank, which is one, does not equal the number of rows. Okay. All right. Now here is a uh, a related point. It's actually more so related by confusion. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, here it is. Uh, let's talk about a system of equations. A system of equations, such as this one, is called homogeneous if the right hand side is all zeros. And uh, a nice observation is that a homogeneous system always has a solution. And it's not hard to see what that solution is, the trivial solution that will always work. Right? Just plug in all zeros on the left. The left side is all zeros. Sure enough, the right side is the same, all zeros, and so you have a solution. Now, you look at what we see here, and we say, well, okay, we have a solution. Always have a solution. It's tempting, then, to say that this is an example of the existence property, but it isn't. This is not an example of the existence property. You have to keep in mind that the existence property is a reference to just the coefficient side. Right? A, a, you have to be talking about a system. Right? You have to have the entire system to be able to make a reference to the right-hand side.
uh, and specifically to the right hand side being zeros and thus to being able to call it homogeneous. So th this is not an example of the existence property. In fact, the, ex the uh, left hand side here, the, uh, the coefficient matrix need not have the existence property at all. That uh, coefficient side could, could simply not satisfy the property. Um, and there's no contradiction. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> um, pun. Um, this is uh, this is not um, inconsistent because these, this theorem about homogeneous systems is a statement about systems. The existence property is not. The existence property is a statement about coefficient matrices. Right, so. Um, this is not an example of the existence property. Okay, moving along. Let's talk about the uniqueness property. Uh, now, a little awkward. Uh, we want to think of this as being independent of the existence question. So, uh, we want to, therefore, ignore potential existence problems. I want to be able to talk about uh, unique solutions. You know, under what circumstances uh, can I... Uh, guarantee that you know something about unique solutions, and I don't want to have to worry about if there's any solutions at all. I don't want to have to worry about whether um, uh, there's an existence issue. So we want these to be viewed as um, as uh, independent uh, questions. So said differently, we're going to act as if a solution is known to exist, even though we don't. Right? We want to act as if we do know, so that we can talk about. Um, what we're really, really interested in, which is in whether or not such a hypothetical solution would or would not have to be unique. All right, so again, what we're interested in talking about is a property of the coefficient matrix. So we're going to talk about uh, the scenario where we know only the coefficient matrix, and we want to know, knowing only the coefficient matrix, must possible solutions necessarily be unique? Okay. All right. Well, let's just let's think through. Uh, you know, how would I go about uh, answering that question? And uh, let's come back up here, for example, uh, to the, this system. And now we're going to ignore uh, this issue down here. I'm going to ignore the fact that there's possible contradictions here. I just want to look just at the coefficient matrix, right? Not worry about whether there is a solution or not, but if there were a solution, how would I decide, can I decide, would there or would there not be uh, a uniqueness to the solution, or might there be multiple solutions? Okay, well, so how do we find our solutions? Well, we solve for our pivot variables in terms of our free variables. And the free variables get to be whatever they want. For every choice that we make for our free variables, we get a solution. So, well, gosh, that means we're going to, we, uh, as long as we have free variables, we're going to have infinitely many solutions, and therefore we're not going to have unique solutions. Okay, so free variables are the problem. And you see here we have a, uh, a pivot there and a pivot there. So in this case, we have one, two, three free variables and so if there were solutions here those solutions are definitely not going to be unique solutions because the free variables could be any values at all okay so simple answer then to this uniqueness question um, how can you tell if a matrix has uniqueness no free variables if there's no free variables then you solve for your pivot variables in terms of, well, there's no free variable. So you solve for your pivot variables, full stop, and you have solved for your pivot variables. And by the way, since there are no free variables, that means you've solved for all of your variables, full stop. So you have, therefore, unique solutions. So this is the condition. No free variables in the reduced echelon form. That's what gives you this uniqueness property of the coefficient matrix. Okay. Um, some equivalent formulations. Again, uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, free variables are characterized by uh, columns with no pivot. So another way of saying that there are no free variables, well, there are there are, there are then no 
columns without a pivot. In other words, there's a pivot in every column. So that's, again, a morally equivalent statement phrased a little bit differently. Well, if there's a pivot in every column, then the number of pivots is equal to the number of columns. So again, this, uh, this uniqueness property, as previously discussed, surprisingly relates to this very simple quantity called rank. Namely, just count up the pivots. How many pivots do you have? Okay. All right, so you look at these uh, scenarios here. Uh, this coefficient matrix, uh, independent of the question of whether um, uh, solutions exist, if you look at this possible scenario of a system here, um, if there were a solution, would it be unique? Well, no, it would not be unique because there's a free variable. That second free variable could be any value. And then you solve for your pivot variable in terms of that free variable. And so you're going to have infinitely many solutions. All right. So this does not, this original matrix with that reduced rational and form does not have the uniqueness property. Okay. On the other hand, this, um, the matrix who has that reduced echelon form. Let me think about a possible system. Um, if there were a solution, and again, not relevant to the uniqueness question, but presuming that there is a solution, would that solution be unique? Well, let's see here. We have a pivot here, and we have a pivot there. There's no free variables. We would solve for our pivot variables period, and that's the solution, and it is a unique solution. So this coefficient matrix does have the uniqueness property. The original matrix here that has this reduced Rechelin form does have the uniqueness property. Okay. All right, there are some uh, related facts, and these are discussed in the book. Um, uh, first, a quick observation, and that is if you have an M by N matrix, and by the way, don't forget M refers to the number of rows, N refers to the number of columns, nice little shorthand. Um, then the rank, the number of pivots, well, that's got to be less than or equal to both of those numbers, because you can have at most one pivot per row, whoops, at most one pivot per row, tells you the number of pivots is less than or equal to the number of rows. But you can also have at most one pivot per column. And that means the number of pivots is less than or equal to the number of columns. Okay. Well, with that in mind, simply knowing the shape of the matrix in some situations can tell you some useful information about the properties that the solutions uh, might have. Um, so let's consider this scenario where, uh, where M is greater than N, and keep in mind what that means. M is the number of rows, so we have more equations. N is the number of columns, which relates to variables. So we have more equations than variables. Another way to think about this. And I like to also think about this as a tall and thin uh, matrix. So tall and thin because there's, uh, there's more equations, right? possibly lots of equations, and fewer variables. Okay. All right, well, what can we conclude about um, such a coefficient matrix? Well, is there any way that there could be a pivot in every row? Well, the thing is, uh, there's at most that many pivots, grand total. And there are m more rows then than there are possible pivots. And that means that no, there can't be a pivot in every row. Of course, you can also see that just from the shape of the matrix, right? There's just, there's not enough columns and wherever the pivots might be, there's just, gosh, you just, there's no way that you can get one. There's going to be rows that don't have pivots in them. There's just too many rows. Okay. And that means that even though I don't even know the numbers in this coefficient matrix, just by knowing the shape of it, I know that this coefficient matrix cannot have the existence property. So that's a 
kind of a clever solution, really. Okay. All right, clever observation. Uh, so let's see, there's a, another, no, oh, no, let me point out, and this is important, um, that's not to suggest, tall and thin matrix, that, you know, just because the best case, in some sense, has a pivot in every column, and you still don't have a pivot in every row, that doesn't mean that there actually is a pivot in every column. There could easily be yet another missing pivot, and now there's a column that has no pivot as well. This is a very common mistake that um, students think that when there's uh, when there's too many rows, that so, that somehow forces there to be a pivot in every column. Absolutely not true. In fact, we have some uh, ex easy examples. Here's one. Right, with more rows than columns, still not a pivot in every column. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, another related fact all on here. Um, if it goes the other way, if you have uh, more variables, namely more columns, uh, then you do equations. So you have fewer equations, namely fewer rows. Right? Um, said differently, if you have a uh, short and wide uh, matrix, so a matrix that's you know, like this, that. So more columns than rows, more variables than equations. Then even though I don't know what these numbers are in this coefficient matrix, I can already guarantee uh, this matrix does not have the uniqueness property. Or said differently, if this were the coefficient matrix of a system, that system could not possibly have unique solutions. And again, the answer is by looking at the pivots. Well, where are the pivots going to be? You're going to have, at most, m pivots. Because there's at most one in each row. Well, that means you definitely have fewer pivots than you have columns. And um, that means that you definitely are going to have free variables. You're going to have columns with no pivots, and therefore, definitely free variables. So some of the, I don't know exactly which ones, who knows, I mean the pivots might be there and there and there, well then that's a free variable and that column corresponds to a free variable. So definitely free variables and definitely not the uniqueness property. All right. Uh, last observation and that is uh, uh, any uh, linear system, there's only three cases of how many solutions there might be. There's either no solutions, or there's one solution, or there are infinitely many solutions. And this is just a matter of thinking about the possibilities. Um, if there's a contradiction, no solutions. Done. If there's not a contradiction, well, if there's not a contradiction, then, well, there's two possibilities. Either your system has the uniqueness property, in which case you'd have, uh, in which case you'd have one solution, or it does not have the uniqueness property, in which case you have a free variable, in which case you have infinitely many solutions. So again, only three possibilities here, zero, one, or infinitely many.